Look good. This is always the hard part. Just, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, it's my prop. Hello and welcome to the Water Cooler, episode, I don't know, six, five, something like that. I believe it's six. Uh, I'm one of your hosts. My name's Matt. That's Steve. What the hell are you doing? I'm uh, playing a little bit of Pokemon Sapphire. Why aren't you playing Pokemon Go? Uh, Sapphire, so years ago. Anyways, um, so we haven't done this in a while. That's cool. Uh, anyways, we're trying something new this time. We're doing a video podcast. You can see us. We can't see you. It's all right like that. It's probably, probably better that way. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> anyways, this is a conversational podcast. Uh, we're focused on gamers, mostly the relationships they have, but because we're lame, uh, we mostly just talk about news and stuff that's going on, but we've got a good show, we've got stuff planned out, we got, we're got we doing it differently than we normally do, so, yeah. Anyways, if you want to suggest topics for the show, that's cool, uh, you can do it at the water, yeah, actually email us, thewatercooler at zeronotoriety.com. That's actually linked to my phone now. So I can get those emails any time of the day and probably respond, but I don't know yet. I haven't tested it. Uh, you can also get us on uh, the forum, zeronotoriety.com slash watercooler suggestions. Um, we want stories, like if something funny has happened in a game that you played. That's awesome. That's what we want to hear about. Um, anything you want us to read, talk about, news, anything that you think is interesting, let us know. Uh, also... What else do I have? I haven't done this in a while. My intros are falling apart. That's all right. Um, yeah. We're going to try to do better than we've done, but we'll see. Uh, a lot of changes have happened in our personal lives. A lot of stuff's been going on over the summer. Right. We hope your summer's been going good. Let us know. All right. So, anyways, the way we do this is we cover news and articles, opinion pieces, stuff like that, mm-hmm. kind of bigger gaming news. Uh, in a section we call Respawn Remarks. So we're going to go ahead and jump right into that, do a couple sections, and then we'll get to our topic of the show before we let you go. All right, so just letting you know, but as we got dive into this, uh, everything, all the articles that we will be talking about, discussing, will be in the show notes uh, on the website, zeronotoriety.com. Check it out. Um, so let's dive in. What's the first story we got? What's the first thing we got here? All right, first story is about Ubisoft. We want our games to be perfect, and we're showing it all the time. Uh, where's my off? Oh, I didn't have an office list. That's why. Anyways, um, whoever wrote this, it was on WeWriteThings.com. You can actually just search for the, the title. We said Ubisoft, we want our games to be perfect, and we're showing it all the time. And the writer writes, Bugs and struggles are common for games when they first launch. When you take a look at games, okay, how, do, how the hell did I write this? Oh, I know what I did. Highlighting. We're trying something new. You're watching us struggle. It's cool. Um, <laughs> we used highlighting. Because we're idiots. Um, <laughs> bugs and struggles are common for games when they first launch. We've seen that no matter what, what the game is, you see problems. It's more common now than it used to be. We've talked about it before. Right. Yeah. Um, anyways, when you look at the games, Ubisoft has released post-Unity. They've created gems like Assassin's Creed Syndicate, Far Cry 4, Far Cry Primal, and Tom Clancy's The Division, among them. Uh, some of these have been delayed for different reasons, stuff like that. That's what they're trying to say in this article overall. Is they delay games to make them better. The firm has games like Watch Dogs 2, Grow Up, South Park, The Fractured But Whole, and Steve scheduled to release at the end of the year. It would be surprising if those games didn't meet the type of quality we have come to expect over the last couple of years. Alan Core, who is the head of EMEA for Ubisoft, spoke about what Ubisoft wants most when it comes to releasing new games. He says, quote, What we want is that our games are perfect when we release them and are showing that all the time. So we're eight, we are giving them the time they need to blow away everybody. That's our mission. The beauty of Ubisoft also is that we is to be able to give time to games when we feel that they are not completely polished. 
We are trying to release the dates. Of, we are trying to respect the release dates, of course, but sometimes we have to make the decision to push back the project, like we did with the division, for example, which we had to post, postpone twice because we felt it wasn't completely polished yet. Quality for us is super important. Every day we work to make sure that the worlds we create are as perfect as possible before we release them to fans, but because ultimately they decide if the game is good and if they will help with word of mouth. Core told Game Informer. Uh, delaying a product is, al is always a possibility when game is finished. This is no longer a quote, by the way. Uh, particularly when it is a serious ambition among, along with it. Ubisoft took the steps to delay both Watch Dogs and The Division, like Gore mentioned, and those decisions ended up making those, sure those games were ready to go at launch. Uh, by the way, it's saying here that Watch Dogs 2 will be released this coming November, which I am not looking forward to necessarily. Um, um, it just seems funny to me, which is why I picked that story out for us to cover, because Ubisoft games are never called. That that's true. They're hugely ambitious, and that's that's the cool thing is like you wouldn't get those kinds of games from anybody else. Right. But it seems that it's because they're they're not they're notoriously known for having like for Assassin's Creed it was annualized and all that stuff, and they'd have thousands of people across dozens of studios, dozens of countries working on this stuff. And it seems to be a case of the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, in my opinion. Yeah. That too many cooks in the kitchen. Exactly. They've got too much stuff going on. So you, someone over here is working on combat system, and then someone over here is working on pathing, and somehow they make stuff that breaks. Yeah. It doesn't communicate well because one team, like, because guy A can't just walk down the hall and talk to guy B and be like, uh, something's wrong. Like, you fit, you did this part, I did this part, like, let's fix it, you know? You've got different time zones, different people, different countries, language barriers. One could argue that the technology keeps us close. And, That's you know, true. So it's a lot faster than it was, but, uh, yeah, there's still one of the issues, I think. Like yeah, you're I, saying, there's too many, too many different hands in the mix. Yeah, it's, it's good that they have that as a goal. We'll see if they can hit that. Yeah. But I think until they're willing to uh, scale teams back, maybe scale back some ambitions, or do like what they finally did, which was like, like well, we're not going to release an annualized mm -hmm. um, Assassin's Creed this year. We're just going to uh, release a movie this year. Don't worry about it. It'll be cool. <laughs> <laughs> Although I, I find it humorous that they put Watch Dogs on that list since that game was. Yeah, that was that. That was, that was crap. That was crap. Ubisoft crap. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, was, who do you got next? All right. Next is. Let's see. NX? Yes. All right. Nintendo NX is a portable console with detachable controllers. Uh, Nintendo's upcoming NX will be a portable handheld console with detachable controllers. I guess there's a number of sources that have confirmed this to Eurogamer. Uh, this is right off the Euro Eurogamer website. Written by Tom Phillips, by the way. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Tom. All right. Basically, it's touted as uh, just some, another mobile game system. Uh, it looks, well, some a lot of the stuff basically looks a lot like a Wii U that you can actually carry out of your house. Right. Um, and... Basically, you'll be it will play the same quality on the move as you do at home. You can hook it up to your TV and play it on a large screen. Uh, let's see. Uh, some of the things that they're doing is they're going to be using game cartridges as their choice of physical media. Uh, that doesn't rule out that probably most of their business will be the digital downloads, since they say they're going to be compatible with what the Wii U titles and I believe a lot of uh, that uh, console thing that they do. Uh, virtual the, console. The virtual console. I think. So they'll be doing that. Um, it's not to say that 
it's going to be like the handhelds of Nintendo's past, like the 3DS or the DS. It'll actually have some impressive technology in it, but they are not shooting for next gen type. Mm-hmm. They're not even concerned with, uh, you know, graphical superiority. It's more like the depth of the gameplay is what they're looking for. Right. Uh, they believe that it will be using a Tegra processor for to run its graphics and some first party type operating system from Nintendo. They honestly, even with reading all of this, they don't know a whole lot about it. They 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 managed to do a good job of keeping the lid on what this thing's actually going to look like. Yeah, the 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 rendition, like what everybody seems to be talking about as far as what it looks like, um, is Kind of, if you imagine a Wii U gamepad, and you have, like, literally just the sides where the screen are just mm-hmm. break off, that's kind of how it looks in the, the mm-hmm. like, you know, technical artist rendition. Or yeah, whatever. it's just a very But, the con- like, you'd have one controller that would have a thumbstick and a D-pad, and the other controller is a thumbstick and four buttons. But it would probably be, I can imagine something where when you have, have them hooked into the console... Like, the right half of controller B Mm -hmm. functions with the left half of controller A. Mm -hmm. And those function together to form one controller when you're using it as a portable device. Right. And then they come apart. So you have two controllers that are mirror images of each other. But that'd be... I'm I'm interested to see what it looks like and if all these rumors are true. I guess a lot of people are saying... Most of the bigger sites are saying, yes, this, this actually seems pretty credible. And at first... When I first heard about that, uh, I was terrified. I, I thought they had the, they were sending it off to die. That was my first impression. I was right. like, they're making a, a handheld Wii U number two, basically. That, but then like the more I heard like other people like, no, this is this is awesome because they they look. Let's say what um, their motto is now, like take your games with you, yeah, or something, you, something yeah. like that, and uh, like. That, I guess, makes a lot more sense. Right. You know, sometimes you want, like, I guess people have said that they want to play their DS games on their TV. Right. Like, why can't I do that? And then why can't I take just my other games with me? You know, so not going after the graphical parity with everybody else is not necessarily a big deal if they can... But Nintendo has always done a great job of finding a game that people really latch on to. Um, right. There's us- it, it'll usually be, um, you know, a handful of titles, literally four or five major titles that people just don't put down. They, they don't get it wrong when it comes to finding something that's a lot of fun. That a lot. Of I mean, their software is usually, like their first party software, yeah. though, it's really cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes they have some really bad ideas, from what I understand, because I haven't played a Nintendo game in <laughs> a really long time. But most of the time, they're, they know how to hit a home run. Yeah, this is true. With their software, but I hope they just, they don't make it as much like a toy as it seems like the Wii U was and right. I mean the Wii was kind of a novelty because it was one of the it was such a what was the first motion? Yeah. May, well major release as far as a motion controlled right video game because it, it actually came before all of the the connect and all that, so Okay, we're gonna take a break for just a minute. Right. And we will be right back with some more news. Alright, all right, and we're back. <laughs> All right. Uh, next article is the PlayStation 4 Neo launch may be a decidedly low key affair from GamingBolt.com author Pramap. All right. He begins by saying the cause of common wisdom tells us that Sony are preparing to launch the PlayStation 4 Neo, the upgraded PlayStation 4 console that we already know exists, thanks to Sony officially confirming it sometime this year. Most of the leak, leaks regarding the console, which subsequently seem to have been on point, seem to indicate an October release for the upgraded console, possibly right along the place, alongside the PlayStation VR. Uh, what people are worried about is that it's, well, at least the major debate in this uh, article is 
why or is it possible that it's not actually going to be coming out in October because of how close it is to that time? We're only a couple months away. <clears throat> However, uh, the author goes ahead and says, well, and argues that a lot of companies, especially uh, major tech companies, wait until right before release to actually start building up hype on their products and uh, do the advertising until even some a couple weeks before they're actually released. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The model of announcing a product very near to its release is a mainstay in the smart device world, he writes here. Just as you know with a new iPhone or a new Galaxy phone uh, that's come out onto the market. Uh, Let's see, but he says that that's not just limited to the phone market, that it works for the consoles too. Let's see. Beginning with the assumption that the Sony plan to reveal the PlayStation 4 Neo shortly before its presumed October launch, um, we must ask ourselves why. Why would they do that when the Microsoft, when Microsoft has already started talking about Scorpio a year before its Launch and the reason is simple. The Neo is not meant to be a whole new, uh, not like a truly next gen release. It's meant to kind of be a 4.5, kind of like a high end version of the PlayStation 4. Luxury PS4. Basically, yes, a luxury version of PlayStation 4. They don't want to alienate the people that have already purchased uh, PlayStation 4s because there's, you know, been a Basically, a, a large part of the console market has been completely taken over by the PS4, um, though the Xbox One is closing in on them. Uh, but he's, they don't want, like I've said before, they don't want to feel, make PS4 owners feel like they've wasted their money, right. basically. So the games for both systems will play on both. There may be some uh, like appearance improvements on your screen, especially if you have um, a better TV mm. or something like that. But other than that, it, uh, so far as they've said here, actually there's no real list of games that are really slated to just be for that Neo release. Right. From what I understand, uh, speaking of that, that... Um, I think one of the rumored perspectives is that every game, because it is supposed to be like a, uh, a luxury PS4, that they're trying not to alienate current current PS4 owners right, by right. saying everything that comes out in the PS4 environment has to work for all PS4s, not just the new one. Right. Like that's you, there's, you have a one benchmark that it must meet to run on all. And then you can be like, you can do whatever you want, make it look as pretty as you want. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that even though program. it's not mentioned in this article, I think the important thing to remember is that they're going to be putting out the PlayStation VR. Most of those the systems that use this, I mean, that's not going to be a cheap peripheral no. for people. Uh, so did they? I think they announced the price, didn't they? Right. That may have to be something we Was look up. Four hundred? I don't remember. I don't know, but. I really foresee them tying that to the Neo, and that's basically mm -hmm. where that becomes important. So it, it may be just that. And not every PS4 owner is going to be wanting to get into a four or $500 peripheral. Right. Mm -hmm. And, well, that is basically the whole gist of that article. There, that is completely understandable from a marketing point of view to wait until the last minute to start pushing a product, at least from the position that they're taking, because they're not going up against a next-gen console that's basically just a mid-year upgrade of the current one. Uh, now, uh, to add to that point on a separate article uh, taken from businessinsider.com, PlayStation just announced a September event where it will likely unveil the PlayStation 4 successor. Um, although it 
kind of negates what we just said about it truly not being a successor, a successor or a next gen. It's basically an upgrade to current. Um, but the important thing is, is that they are uh, have updated the information and said that you know this is definitely coming out, and we're going to start really pushing on it starting in September. Uh, of course, this yeah, but they haven't actually officially announced the release date. Right. Even know mm -hmm. it's almost they've just they've confirmed that there is or it's been all but confirmed right. that it exists and it's a thing that they're working on. And a lot of people were suspecting that it would release this year mm -hmm. alongside, which is October 13th, is when VR, PlayStation VR releases, and it would release alongside that. You know what, though? I think that a lot of what they do is, you know, what seems to be going on, where they leak just like a tiny little bit of information, is because when you create buzz and you have people like you and me getting on here, mm -hmm. getting on film talking about... Uh, these things it actually builds up a lot of curiosity and then you know in a what way, the hell is this thing yeah what is this thing how do I get my hands mm -hmm. on it you know is it going to be as good I mean the more buzz they get going uh, kind of a pseudo underground mm -hmm. type buzz I mean that generates business all by itself so maybe that's their their angle you know? right and speaking of that we have a little bit more stuff. Um, we have some specs for the PS4 Neo proposed. Uh, uh, what the hell do we have here? That's actually the Scorpio. Yeah, this is Scorpio We're and PS4 gears now. Yeah, um, this is. I actually had the comparison chart. This is what I really wanted um, to compare the PS4 Neo. Rumored what we rumored the specs to be: the current PS4, the current Xbox One, and their successor, the PS4 Neo, and the, the Project Scorpio. So, in CPU, the PS4 currently has 8 Jaguar core clocked at 1.6, or 1.6 gigahertz, excuse me. And Xbox One has 8 Jaguar cores clocked at 1.75 gigahertz. So I never knew that, actually. Mm -hmm. um, PS4 Neo will have 8 Jaguar cores, just like the Xbox One, but they will be clocked at 2.1 gigahertz. Uh, meanwhile, Project Scorpio will also be 8 core, uh, speculation. Uh, overclocked Jaguars or some sort of equivalent uh, uh, type of architecture. architecture. Right. Okay. So GPU, PlayStation 4, uh, has an 18 Radeon GNC compute units at 800 megahertz. That, I don't know what any of that means. Uh, the Xbox One is 12 GNC compute units at 853 megahertz. So it's a little bit, technically a little bit faster, I guess. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the PS4 Neo will have 36 improved GNC compute units at 911 megahertz. Meanwhile, Scorpio is speculated to be between 56 and 60 GNC compute units between 8 and 800 to 850 megahertz. So it'll have a slightly slower clock than the PS4 Neo based on the rumors we heard. And then lastly, there's the memory sector. Uh, PS4 has 8 gigabytes of GD. GDDR5 at 1.76 gigabytes a second of computation speed. Uh, Xbox One has 8 gigabytes of DDR3. That's where the big difference is. That's why the, they say that the PS4 is such a powerhouse, is that GDDR, GDDR5. Yep. But anyways, Xbox One, 8 gigs, DDR3 at 68 gigabytes a second of processing speed with 32 megabytes of ES RAM at massive 218 gigabytes a second. Hoping that's not a tech though. I don't, What's know. That? I don't know what that is. I don't know what any of that stuff is. Oh, I, I, I never. I stopped paying attention <laughs> to that stuff years and years ago. It's just two different ways that the RAM works. Right. Um, um, PS4 Neo, or the Neo, the PS4K Neo, or whatever they're going to call this thing, um, still has 8 gigs of GDDR5, but it's going to be 218 gigabytes of, um, of, of speed. And then the Project Scorpio is supposed to be over 320 gigabytes of bandwidth speculation and 12 gigabytes of GDDR5. So it's going to have 150% of the memory capacity that the uh, PlayStation 4 or PS4 Neo would have. Which is incredible if that's, that, if that's true. Yeah. That Just thing's going to be massively expensive. Well, um, yes, but... Uh 
I don't know. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how far and how much better will game looks uh, is one of the things that will have the 8 CPU cores or 320 gigabytes of memory band with 6 teraflops, whatever a teraflop is, of GPU power, 4K gaming support, and VR support. Uh, this is a machine far more, uh, with far more graphical prowess than the existing Xbox One. And how developers take the advantage of the 6 teraflops of GPU is up to them. Uh, however, let's see. Some developers will take advantage of that 6 teraflops in different means, meaning that they don't have to use the extra processing power to necessarily hit 4K and can channel it towards better looking 1080p experiences. So instead of it being a 30 frames per second thing, it would be six, uh, steady 60 or, you know, minimum 60. You know, so you got some stuff going on there. Uh, what else do we have in this? Well, I think another thing that they're saying is maybe you won't have. Uh, Maybe the resolution won't be greatly improved, but you'll be able to see more things happen on the screen more cleanly without slowing the frame rate is probably what we'll actually see. I think the important thing is, is that both companies are looking forward to the future of VR gaming. They want it to be a big thing. Uh, right now, PlayStation's the only one that has an, uh, a definite as far as a headset that they're going to be pushing out. Whereas with Microsoft, we kind of think it's going to be something with Oculus and um, basically professionals that have looked at the specs that they're seeing right. come out of Project Scorpio said that what's on there could easily run VR. Right. Um, going on to games, peripheral is backwards compatibility with Xbox One. Project Scorpio is a mid-generation Xbox to the Xbox One, just like the PS4, uh, Neo. So all games and peripherals that run on Xbox One will work on the new system, including controllers and Kinect. Presumably initiatives such as Xbox 360 backwards compatibility cross by will set up 10 as well. Additionally, there won't be any Project Scorpio exclusive, despite initially contradictory messaging from Sh Shannon Loftus shortly after the console's announcement that was swiftly corrected by Aaron Greenberg. Also, Bethesda's Todd Howard said, we're moving Fallout 4 to VR and, have to, and to have a console that can support that at the resolution and speed we really want, I think is going to be magical, suggesting Scorpio is what they will be targeting for... Will, uh, be targeting. Pro suggesting Scorpio is what they will be targeting for the future. <laughs> okay, I understand what he's saying. Yeah. All right, so that's that, um, which leads us into our next article. That's pretty cool, you know, that, uh, you know, it's, it seems like uh, mostly Microsoft, you know, they're really learning from, they took a really bad hit with the Xbox One when they, at the announcement and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so they want, want to really come back from that. I think so, they've learned a lot of lessons. From the from everything that they went through with the 360 release, uh, rushing that out only to have all of them overheat with that red ring for so many years. Yeah, and so. Uh, but they did they did take care of that, and that's why that's why the Xbox One is still massive. Is they were like, yeah. we're not going to have that problem again. Right. But they had you know with the uh, always on DRM. And stuff where it had to always be connected to the internet, where right. you had to have connect, and then you didn't have to have connect, and that all that messaging, you know. I mean, it's one of those things where they they double they doubled back really fast, but I think the damage was already done there, and they've had a hard time recovering from that. So now they're trying to overcompensate, or not even overcompensate, just be like, we're here for gamers, we're gonna, you know what I mean? But Microsoft to offer an Xbox One trade-up program for Project Scorpio? This is from TweakTown.com. Microsoft wants to make the transition from Xbox One to Project Scorpio as seamless and easy as possible with a trade-in trade-up program. Uh, whoever wrote this said that uh, they speculate it's likely to be in the range, the $599 range. The damn thing is going to be expensive. Oh, yeah. Almost as much as the PS3. Or was the PS3 600? Was it 700? That one. The very first one was six. Six. six I think. There was a six hundred and a seven hundred dollar version, or something crazy it like that. Anyways, uh, we want to make that transmission as soon as possible, as smooth as possible. Xbox Services Manager Dave McCarthy told the Daily Star. 
some of our retail partners today do trade in programs and that's basic definitely going to be part then that's definitely going to be partnerships we continue we continue to move going forward that's a weird way of writing that yeah we will try partnerships with our retail partners to smooth it up even more with trade in programs and things like that uh, we have no clue how much fraud, how much Scorpio actually costs and how much uh, Microsoft will give you for your Xbox One. Right now, a vanilla 500 gig Xbox One console gets you $100 in GameStop with store credit, $80 in cash. Yes, which is kind of a ripoff, but yeah. that is the way trading stuff is. Don't trade in your consoles; it's not worth it. Uh, trade in rates will likely vary vary from retailer to retailer as well. Uh, if you ha- if I had to guess, the writer. Uh, about the trading rates, I'd say that 110 to 120 for an Xbox One system, depending on make and model, and maybe $160 for the Xbox One S. Uh, which, by the way, the X- Xbox One S just released last week, and at $299. Right. So that thing's pretty cool. It also uh, the, it, it allows some upscaling to 4K, stuff like that, some weird stuff. Um, additionally, in some other Xbox news, I just thought this was interesting. Okay. Microsoft has stealthily revised its Play Anywhere rules, which was a big thing that they had a few weeks ago, confirming that all first-party Xbox One games aren't guaranteed to launch on PC too. So console exclusives aren't going anywhere, and don't expect to see Halo 6 on PC anytime soon. Uh, as an additional thing, it says, once again, Twilight Scorpio is going to launch, or is expected to launch, holiday 2017. So that's that. What do you think? You looking forward to it? Yeah. What about that Xbox One S? I think I'm going to skip over the S. I'm definitely thinking that even though what I like the most about the S is actually a small thing, the self-contained power block is what I like about the S. Yeah, that is really cool. That's really nice. That it's is... almost a selling point in and of itself. Yeah. Um, one, one less thing to trip over. But uh, I can't justify unless you have something wrong with your xbox one uh that you have currently i don't see a reason to get one you know right um yeah i agree like i don't there's nothing wrong with mine it's except it's call of duty i hate that <laughs> i kind of want to spray paint it but i'm like somebody else would be really mad so <laughs> I, i'm not going to do that Anyways, uh, have you ever heard of this game called No Man's Sky? Of course. You've been a lot of hype about No Man's Sky. Um, so a couple weeks ago, or last week, it was uh, a guy who started posting some videos about it mm-hmm. on YouTube and I guess Daily Motion or whatever. So this is uh, an article. The guy who leaked No Man's Sky videos responds to Sean Murray's tweets. All right, so anyways, Reddit user Damien was the guy who, who I guess, I don't know if he's the one that spent $1,300 buying a version of the game that was leaked on uh, eBay. Um, but he posted on Daily Motion and YouTube or whatever, and uh, Sean Murray expressed his feelings through a tweet and didn't seem happy about the latest leaked videos about No Man's Sky, to be expected. Anyway, after reading the tweets and seeing the response from the developers, Damien expressed how he feels about the whole situation. That's it from, from me, video-wise. Hello, Games and Sean don't like it. It's giving me a headache dealing with the fallout. I don't want to be the guy that spoiled all this cool shit, and I'm j- just leaving it at that. But for now, I'm just going to play the game, keep it to myself, and enjoy it. Uh, Damien is feeling bad about the whole situation. It seems like he understands the hard work the developer did and make, to make No Man's Sky an enjoyable game, and he did not want, did not intend to spoil everything. I'm only a couple of hours in, barely touched a few planets, and I've already had a whole, had many fuck yeah moments. On, in the other, in the one hand, that well, in the one hand, I'd love to to share those with you. But on the other hand, Sean is right. Why why not just wait and experience them firsthand? I don't know. Damien feels guilty about it. He did leak videos in the first. He did leak the videos in the first place. But it seems like he knows that what he's doing is not right. An interview with interview with Kotaku, Damien said, "I expected Sean to tweet negatively about it because let's face it, that it's his job to. But I'll admit." After watching so many of his interviews and knowing how cool of a guy he seemed, he seems, it did make me feel a bit guilty. It wasn't the sole reason for my decision, but it was certainly a factor. But Bill Damien will post some of his first impressions about No Man's Sky and 
He says he, that he will answer people's questions too. I will do a text only post with the first impressions once I'm further in. And yes, I will spoil, spoiler tag it and answer any questions people want to ask. And there will be no screenshots or videos. Text only from here on out, my friends. And it's a compromise respectful of the boundaries in place. And I'm just going to accept it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, it also says No Man's Sky is coming out today, August 9th. Uh, which is pretty cool. Um, it wasn't a game I really paid a whole lot of attention to. Mm -hmm. um, but it does seem interesting. Something I'd like to look at. Uh, too bad it's only for PS4 and uh, PC. I don't have my PC, but probably going to want to run that too well. But I guess since today it was the day of release, it's already getting some mixed reviews. Um, naturally, it's, some people have had access to it for a couple days. So I've got, I'm not going to read these articles or go into them, but I'm just going to read the headlines. Uh, no Man's Sky is emptier than I imagined, but in, written on CraveOnline.com. Basically, this guy just he expected more. I think he got caught. He didn't get go full hype train at the second coming of Christ in a right. video game form. But he's like, I was kind of expecting David Copperfield, and it wasn't a David Copperfield. It was, you know, <laughs> the kid that goes. It was, it was, the, it was the uh, elementary talent show at best, is I think where he's going with it. Right. Um, so you have that, but then again, you have another one from Kramath on Gaming Bowl. No Man's Sky has huge and rare creatures waiting to be discovered. Over six, 160,000 discoveries have been made. And basically he's saying that, you know, testers and stuff like that, before this game has even gone out into the wild, people are making discoveries, people are doing things, they're seeing things. And it's awesome. Because it's populated by things that people see, people name, and all that stuff. So, like, if you see something on a, a planet, and you name it, you've discovered it, you're the first person to find it, it can then go and populate other games. Now this is with, uh, procedurally gen generated, it's, or it's alg al procedurally algorithmically generated. Okay. So it's all done based on an al algorithm and stuff. But also, in, in addition to that, they have also done a gigantic patch, a 1.03 patch that already released today for a for um, game that released today. But it's not like oh, there was a bunch of bug fixes, but okay. I'm sure there were. Mm -hmm. But now it's uh, they're changing the way the universe generates and stuff. Uh, for most people, all you do is just down and install the update before you begin to play. That's the best way to do this. Um, so here's some of the, the things: the three paths. There are, not, there are now unique paths you can follow throughout the game. You must start a game on a fresh save with the patch, as early choices have significant impact on what you will see later in the game in the overall experience. The universe. We changed the rules of the universe generation algorithm. Planets have moved. Environments have been have changed violent. Galaxies have altered shape. And all to create a greater variety earlier. Galaxies are now up to ten, ten times larger. Diversity. Creatures are now more diverse in terms of ecology and density on planets. Wow, there's a whole... Planets. List we, of things yes, there. We've added dead moons, low atmosphere, and extreme hazardous planets. Extreme hazards include blizzards and dust storms. Atmosphere, space, nighttime, and day skies are now four times more varied due to the new atmospheric systems, which refracts more light, more accurately to allow more intense sunsets. Planet rotation, terrain generation, ship diversity, inventory, trading, feeding, survival, graphical effects, balancing, combat, space combat, exploits, stability, space station, networking, ship scanning. What? Fly over terrain and writing. Wait, These writing. Are, yeah, I holy don't crap! Okay, you you have the Atlas I'm path. Going by that okay, game. writing. The Atlas path has been rewritten by James Wallow, writer on Deus Ex and me. I think it's me being uh, Sean. Mm -hmm. I think it speaks over the to the overarching theme of player freedom more clearly now. The early mission text has been rewritten to allow for multiple endings. Wow, it's like they completely redid the whole thing. Um, and yeah, I guess they're going to continue to do all these free updates and stuff. Should be pretty interesting, pretty cool. Um, actually, the patch notes, I'm like, that makes me more interested in it. I don't know why. Maybe I have a thing for patch notes. Mm -hmm. But that's it for the stories we've got. Let's move on to uh, another thing.
Uh, do we have time, or should we take a break? We need to take a break. Cause it's All right, we will take a break, and we will be right back. And we're back. All right. Um, so just a reminder, all the links and everything for all of the articles that we've been talking about will be in the show notes on zeronotoriety.com. Look for the water cooler episode number probably six, I think. Is six, it? yeah. Six or 6.5 or seven. I don't know what it's going to be. The water cooler has been empty for some time. Yes, it has been. Yeah. I need to fix that. Um, anyway, we're moving on to our last and final segment, which is going to be our topic of the show, which if you want to suggest the topic of the show, please do that. Either email it to us or forum, whatever. Get it to us. It's fun. We want to talk about something we don't have to come up with. That'd be great. Um, it's a sh- uh, topic we've talked about before, but it's censorship in games. Um, censorship. Public outcry versus original vision and artistic expression. Right. Um, it's the general idea that somebody comes up with a game and something happens and they, a uh, pop culture event, for example, I guess, uh, take what was it? Grand Theft Auto 3 uh, had uh, uh, Twin Towers in the game or something like that, and then 9-11 happened in 2001, right. and they took that mission out or whatever it was that was. They took all those references out, right. um, which that's being sensitive to certain things, so that's understandable. And then, But then there's things like um, Street Fighter where they had the butt thing. Where or the girl was smacking her butt. And yeah, victory and then dance. nobody really, I don't think anybody was out saying, oh, this is sexist or anything else. They right. just went through and changed it. And you and I, I was like, they shouldn't have changed it, I think was our opinion. Right, they should have just left it. And it made me wonder if I'm not, as I'm politically minded, you know, everybody should be able to do their own thing. You can sell whatever you want to sell or whatever. Um... I guess it comes down to at one point uh, in in major franchises or what or whatsoever do the do the people who created it who own the intellectual property or who are actually working on it do they have more ownership of what the game turns out to be or is it the people who are eventually going to spend the money on the game that should have a greater impact on its on, moral code, basically. On its, on its moral code and how, how the content, yeah. when it releases. So, basically, it's uh, Capcom wanted to, for whatever reason, they wanted to, you know, take out some of the racy stuff in Street Fighter, so they did. They're, they own the IP, they own the game, they own the characters. What right do we have to complain? What right whatsoever? Um, but, on the other hand, there are people who have grown up with this game. They've been playing this game for how long? 10, 15 years? How long, how long has it been out? And they, because they're the ones that they're making the game for. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. you don't, you know, to make a, a, a comparison, you don't, um, for Valentine's Day, you don't say, I don't like roses, so I'm not buying you roses, I'm buying you daisies. But your wife really liked roses. Like, does it matter what you want to give them versus what they want to receive? Like, everybody would say that, oh, that would be a bad call right there, like, in your relationship. Right. That would be a bad call. But in terms of, like, we live in a capitalist economy, they can sell whatever they want to sell. What do you think? Uh, I honestly feel like, well... Developers have some responsibility not to hit things that are sensitive, like the example you gave about the Twin Towers and Grand Theft Auto. That was a good example of where it's a good idea to cut it would, something it like would that. Have, it would have struck a chord at, at the time. It would during, hurt people's feelings, and you just yeah, you it know, would, during that the time, that was an a, extreme example. That's a, but yeah, it, that would be an extreme example. But I mean, a, but hitting. Doing things, I think that any time we point our fingers at, say, at something and saying something is definitely bad and we should take it out of here, I mean, it makes something that could have been just overlooked as humorous 
into something that is dirty or bad or however you mm-hmm. want to look at it. Because um, g- games have a big influence on their audiences and stuff like right. that. Especially like kids and stuff that are like, that is their experience to um, moral decisions, you know, uh, the difference between good and evil, you know, right. you know what I mean? Because that's kind of, kids. They shouldn't necessarily be learning all these things exclusively from games, but that's a consequence that could be occurring. And, you know, it's like, well, should developers be taking this moral high road? Or should they be able to say, we're going to uh, in, in, you know, indulge in more adult themes? We're going to go ahead and, you know, go and muddle around in that gray area? I, I think... A lot of it has an audit, depends on the audience that you're catering to as well. Street Fighter has never been, for instance, we're using that example, it's never been kind of like the Mortal Kombat, where right. you already know coming out of the gate as a mature game, if a child's playing that game, the parents aren't really doing their job. Right. Um, but. Um, Street Fighter is also a beat em up. I mean, that is yeah. a brawler. I mean, <laughs> I was about to say. There is violence there, already assumed in that with the fighter title. Yeah, and as far as the sexuality goes, it's, it originally came from another culture that has an entirely different view of sexuality. Right. You know, the Japanese culture, they're weird when it comes to sexuality, not just saying they're into weird things. But, you know, they have festivals de- dedicated to fertility and stuff like that, stuff we don't have here in the West. Right. You know? Yeah, stuff that we're a lot more... Closed, they're, they're more open... Like, and, shut door and close, yeah, like, don't talk you know, about they're it. They're more open to those sorts of things and more, like, they have the dating sims and, like, they, like some of the games that they have would be really racy over here. And like, oh, they'd you know, race in my eyebrows if they weren't completely banned as soon as they hit our shores, you know? Right. We don't see that stuff here. You know, or they never try to release it over here, anyway. Right. Yeah. You know, so um, that's one thing is you know that, and then the cultural differences. Um, I was thinking of something else, but you know, and then par- what role do parents play? Like, what role does the vocal minority play? You know, a lot of the times they'll change something to appease a vocal minority or even a silent minority, mm-hmm. like. Uh, video game characters being gay. I have nothing against people being gay if they want to be gay or whether they are gay because, you know, I do believe that it's not a choice, it's just something just there. Whatever. But, um, you know, if when they put it in games and it becomes like, are they they're making, like, it, it games are art. Like, a lot of people want to say games are art. Right. And in, in the effect of games are art, then they have no right whatsoever to, say, complain at, at all. That's like when you see a movie it's, that's rated R. Right. Or whatever uh, rating it may be, like a mature rating right. on a movie. When you see that rating, you understand that the content can be offensive. Right. It can be profane. There will probably be some nudity in it. And you expect that. Mm -hmm. And then the creators of those movies, they don't say, well, you know what, we're going to say less racially sensitive things because uh, then they'll try to ban this movie or whatnot. No, sometimes to tell the story, you will have to broach uh, sensitive things. Mm -hmm. You You may even have to show images where hate comes across, but it's to tell the story, not to influence people into following that right. ideology. And I think they fail to um, see that with games, and I think it's because of the in- interactive part of it, because you're actually physically, you know, through at least through your controller and through the character on the screen that you are manipulating, you are part of that story at that point. Mm-hmm. But it's not like it's meant to be a training tool for your behavior going forward. And I, I feel like a lot of these people that don't have a whole lot of experience with games, like this minority that you're talking about sometimes, um, they will tend to force their beliefs on that particular art medium. Right. 
And I think it's because it's nothing, it's not static. You are interacting with it. I think that's why they're so harsh on it all the time. Right. So, anything else you're thinking about on that? No. Are we gonna, that, that'd be our shortest topic of the show ever. Only but because you, te- you, normally you just take off. We give it to you, and you're like, and I'm like, oh. I, th- I think it's because we didn't prepare as well. We have a lot more articles to discuss in this particular show. I think right this now. has been the console centric yeah. uh, episode. Um, there's just a lot of stuff going on. We're about to kick into the major game season. I'm really excited. I'm hoping our next episode will, will speaking, get. Speaking of that, uh, what game coming? What games are coming up that you're looking forward to? Uh, the games coming up that I'm looking forward. Battlefield One, mm-hmm. that's that's numero uno on my list. Uh, Call of Duty, but you know I can't say that for this guy since he's not a big Call of Duty fan. Um, uh, okay. uh, the one I'm really looking forward to, and I really have to find out a release date. I'm not sure if it's going to come out for the holiday. Is that Scalebound? Uh, so one to look at. Uh, they did some videos from this past E3, mm-hmm. and it, it was amazing. Is that the one where you ride the dragon? The yeah, dragon? dragons. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> Multiplayer. Mm-hmm. Boss battles. Yeah. What What more it, could you ask? <laughs> I don't know. It's, it, <laughs> I'm always leery about games that are, are like very Japanese games. It is very much like... It is. It's a Japanese game, and I've never been... They've never really caught me because it seems like there's way too many numbers on screen. But then again, there were a lot of numbers on screen for the division, but I didn't really notice them. There was a lot of numbers for Borderlands, too. I didn't play with Borderlands except a couple times. I keep forgetting that. <laughs> for some reason, I keep thinking you were there. But Everybody no, else was really into Borderlands. Borderlands was... I was like, this game's cool, I should get it, and then never got it. Yeah. That showed a lot of numbers too. Um, I think I believe that scale bound numbers are subtle too when you see the damage that you do. Ah, the J- Japanese game just feels like just the combat always feels so obtuse. Um, or it I, just I, looks I, like it is. I'm never really like I'm like this this. I think now like a large barrier to entry is I guess my biggest way. Uh, my biggest well, way Japanese game. well, because you don't. A lot, the focus isn't always on the impact. It's more like number damage. Like they keep uh, track of a lot of that. Um, but from what I've seen, it, it looks more like another game you have never played before, which is like Shadows of the Colossus, which is to uh, me yeah. a pinnacle. That, that game, I have yet to see a game that comes that that's like that. Even looks close. Mm-hmm. But. Uh, what else? Uh, Horizon 3. That's another one. Great people that like racers, yes. Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't know when Pokemon Sun and Moon is coming out, but I'm looking forward to that, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. Ah, about the only thing I've got on my radar right now is Battlefield 1. And... Uh, Stuff like that. I want to play Inside, which it came out a few weeks ago. I haven't gotten a chance to. It took me until... Uh, Inside's Lim- that one where there's not... You're like, you don't know what's happening to you. Right. Okay. There's no dialogue. There's It's a puzzle game. It's uh, like, a, like a sequel to uh, Limbo. Sam oh, Limbo. It is, is it a sequel? It's not, it? not really a sequel, but it's made by the same developer. It's the same kind of tone. Tone and style. There's a little more color in in this okay. one. Um, it's just different. I guess there's um, some other stuff coming out. Uh, like I want to get into some games that have already come out, but there's nothing really that's jumping out at you yet. Yeah, I mean, I listen to podcasts all the time about what stuff's coming out, and it's just like I don't really notice. Like it, I've just been. I mean, right now I'm broke anyways, so. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> if I can't afford the game, it doesn't matter how good it is. Right. Um, and that's the biggest thing for me is I'm always afraid of getting into a game too late and then the, everything, like, I got into Division like a week after it came out and it was almost too late because I'm still like, what, level 28 or 29? Like, I haven't even gotten to 
and everybody's done playing that, and like it's not a fun game to play by yourself. No, no, it's better in a group. So actually, it's 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 one of the things that are kind of like the big, uh, the whole epicenter of our whole channel is how much more fun it is to play games. Right, and that's the thing, like a group and rather than being a single that, that's, player. Yeah, that's how I've changed a lot and what, like your biggest gripe is you're like, you don't play games. And I'm like, because I only want to play games with people. Right. And it's a lot of it has to do with, you know, personal stuff and everything and just a lot of changes going on in life. Yeah. And you have Adult that. life. Yeah, don't don't ever grow, get old. That sucks. Oh. That shit isn't made. It's <laughs> not for sissies, as they say. Or for gamers, for that matter. Um, But yeah, like, that's the thing, like, I love games, and I've, sometimes I've worried, I'm like, maybe I'm growing out of games. No. no that can't be no. it. No. Can't no, be that. that. That can't be it. No. Um, but yeah, like, just, games don't grab me like they used to, but I think it's just because I want, I don't want to have these experiences by myself. Right. I, I, a lot of it has to do with me spending so much time by myself anyways. Right. Uh, because of my job. But, that's that. Anyways, um, so... We're going to go ahead and get going. Uh, you can email us, thewatercooler at zeronotoriety.com. Uh, you can visit the forums, uh, zeronotoriety.com slash watercooler suggestions. Um, you can also go to our website, obviously, Zero Notoriety, or YouTube, which is where this video podcast is going to post, right. um, which is youtube.com slash zeronotorietygaming. I think that still works. Um, you can tweet at us at zero notoriety. We have the they're connected to both our phones. Right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and Facebook, uh, www.facebook.com slash zero notoriety. Uh, anyway, I'm Matt. Steve. And we will see you guys next time.